Hello everyone, and welcome back to another video, where today we will be doing a teardown of a Perkin Elmer Spectrum 2000 Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrometer, or FTIR. Before we begin, I thought it might be a good idea to cover the basics of FTIR instrumentation. If you are in general not familiar with IR spectroscopy, I will put some links in the description that I highly suggest you check out. Without further ado, an FTIR spectrometer starts with an infrared light source, such as a glow bar or a Nernst glower, that are capable of emitting continual radiation across the infrared region. These are directed via an optical assembly into an interferometer, for example the Michelson style interferometer shown here, and commonly employed in such systems. Additionally, a helium neon laser is often installed and aligned with the optical path to act as a stable infrared calibration beam that allows us to correctly line up our spectrum during analysis. Within the interferometer, the beam is split in half using a germanium coated potassium bromide beam splitter, as both of these materials are invisible to infrared radiation. One of the beams then travels to a fixed mirror and returns to the beam splitter. The second beam travels to an adjustable mirror that we can move in order to change the optical path length between the two beams. Upon recombining, the beam is then sent through the sample into a detector, classically either a deuterated triglycerin sulfate detector or a cryocooled mercury cadmium telluride detector that are capable of producing current when they are impacted by the infrared light. More modern systems may use other detector types that have higher accuracy and are able to function at room temperature. The light intensity can then be plotted versus the position of the adjustable mirror in the interferometer assembly. Using a Fourier transform, this data can be used to construct the IR spectrum, which gives us useful structural information about chemical compounds. Advantages of FTIR systems over classical dispersive ones include faster scan times, higher resolution, simpler mechanical construction, and less stray light. Finally, taking a brief look at our machine here, it is constructed of three boxes, those being the optical module, sample, and detector areas. The machine is then connected to a computer via a PCI interface card, which unfortunately I do not have, and as such I was unable to plug the machine into a computer or to operate it. First, I lifted the lids of the machine. I had already attached a desiccant to the optical module to prevent the potassium bromide windows from getting damaged by moisture. The machine was bought secondhand for £50 from eBay. It was described as not being able to power on, but of course the first thing I did was to check the fuse. I then proceeded to disassemble the optical module. First was the desiccant chamber. This turned out to be empty. Next was the beam splitter.
The disc was badly damaged by moisture and had large visible cracks. However, it had a very beautiful rainbow-like appearance, probably from the residual germanium. Finally was the spare beam splitter. This also turned out to be empty. I then remove the LED panel that displays the status of the machine. Next was the main cover for the optical module. and the covers for the sample and detector areas. Now that we're able to see inside the spectrometer, we of course need to figure out how it works. This starts with the machine's power supply board. Power is supplied through a kettle plug to this small enclosure. AC power is converted to a smooth continuous DC voltage using a set of transformers, inductors and capacitors. Various voltage levels are then supplied through pins on these green connectors and the board is able to transmit and receive control data through this blue connector. The power board is mounted on these two metal pins. The power and control cables are then connected using the green and blue connectors. These are then supplied to the main motherboard below the machine, as well as the two control boards located here next to the optical module. There are connectors on the back. These allow the machine to be purged with dry nitrogen gas to preserve the optics. There are analog connectors, which in all likelihood allow the machine to be connected to an external integrator for data analysis. There is also a LIMO connector that allows us to connect and control the machine using a personal computer. There is also the small LED panel connected to the control board that displays the system state. The helium neon laser can be seen here. It is supplied power by this cable. The laser shoots out a beam which gets reflected by two small mirrors into the interferometer. The main infrared light source can be seen here. The light is collected and collimated through this optical setup and then sent into the interferometer using this curved mirror. The interferometer can be seen here. The laser light would enter through these two mirrors located here and travel towards the beam splitter. Likewise, the main infrared source would come through on this side, bounce off this radial mirror and into the interferometer towards the beam splitter.
There is a moving optical mechanism here, controlled by an electromagnet, which shifts the interferometer assembly. If we are to imagine light entering from the laser, it would enter through here. It would be split by the beam splitter. Half of the light would then come through and bounce through these two mirrors and then be reflected back towards the beam splitter. The other half of the light would come directly through, bounce off of two mirrors and then reflect from this mirror here, which is self-mounted on a springboard connected to stepper motors that are able to shift the mirror back and forth, allowing the interferometer path length to be shifted. The light then recombines, travels in the direction of the laser, but this time is directed downwards towards the sample holder and detector. The light travels downwards and gets reflected by a set of multiple curved mirrors in the direction of the sample holder, which would usually consist of a thin liquid layer between two potassium bromide discs or other material that would be invisible to infrared light. The optical path continues further until it reaches this mirror here, which is mounted on a rotating pivot attached to a stepper motor, allowing it to rotate and send the light in either this direction, bouncing off this mirror and towards the deuterated triglycerin sulfate detector, or to send the beam in this direction, towards the mercury cadmium telluride detector, which is attached to a dewer that would be filled with liquid nitrogen or other similar cryogenic cooling liquid, reducing the noise of the signal. This information would then be processed by the circuit board located on this module, and then passed back via the motherboard towards the computer. By removing a copious amount of screws from the underside of the machine, we're able to observe the motherboard. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you have any feedback, feel free to add a comment below or email me. While the machine is not operational, it will make for a nice coffee table. Sorry too for the recent lack of videos, I have been quite busy with exams. I have a few more videos on the way and hopefully they will be out within the next few weeks.